Holy Gospel today is from John 20. We'll be starting at the 18th verse, but I invite you to be seated. We'll be weaving our way through this uh, reading as we have done throughout Lent. We'll kind of pause as we move through it because there's a lot to dig into. And so let's walk with this. So the, it's in your bulletin. You'll be able to follow along. But today we're going to be exploring the gift of doubt. I don't know about you, but when it comes to um, doubt, sometimes that initiates fear in folks. For me, it has been a welcomed friend. It wasn't always a friend for me, doubt. When I was in seminary, I was, it took me seven years to go through seminary because I kept having babies in the middle of it. During Greek, during Hebrew, yeah, it took me a long time. When I finally was ordained, the preacher at the time said, finally, Casey, like the heavens opened, finally. Yeah, it took me forever. But when I was in seminary, I had to go to Luther Seminary for an intensive. And this was a New Testament class, and I had grown up in the church, I had been studying, I had been a youth director for years, and this class started to rock my world. All the things that I thought I knew about Jesus started falling away. And I found myself having to interpret scripture in new ways, with new lenses, and I got halfway through the class and had like an existential crisis. I was like, I, I don't even know who Jesus is anymore. Like, and then I felt like I had an, an imposter syndrome. Have any of you ever had an imposter syndrome where you're like, oh my gosh, I should not ever get up and preach. Oh my goodness, I should never be entrusted to interpret anything because I don't even know what I believe. And I freaked out, like a glorious freak out, tears, calling David, like I just need to leave. I'm done with sermon. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I went to my professor at the time and I went into her office in the middle of my freak out and said, I don't even know who Jesus is. I don't even know. And I told her all of my doubts, and she just continued to smile. She smiled, and she smiled, and she said, you are exactly where you're supposed to be. So I would present a question, and she said, well, have you explored this? Have you thought about this? And she started to have me ask these, like, I didn't have to be afraid of the questions or be afraid of the doubt. She actually led me toward having a Christological lens and to move away from some of the other lenses that I had. And I left that class with one, not a fear of my doubt, but also this deep, deep sense that, that actually doubt would actually help me as a pastor. And actually doubt would actually help me as I was engaging in this life because there's so many things we don't know, right? Oh my goodness. I mean, forget about even just scripture. All the things in our lives we don't know. Like, we don't even know what's going to happen this afternoon. We have doubts about so many things in our lives. And so today we're going to explore doubt, befriending doubt, but also we're going to explore fear. Last Sunday, we preached I had the sermon about fear and great joy. Well, today Jesus meets us in our fear and our doubt. So our gospel today, it actually, it's continuing on. So on last Sunday, Easter, we read Matthew's account of the resurrection. Renee gave us a, just a precursor for in John, it's only Mary Magdalene who goes to the tomb. When she goes to the tomb, the stone is rolled away, and there, um, and so she runs back, tells the disciples, two disciples race there, they go in, they see the grave's clothes like folded off on the corner, and then they leave, and she remains. And when she's remaining there, all of a sudden two angels show up and appear to her, and then a gardener talks to her. She thinks it's a gardener. It turns out to be Jesus. He says, Mary, and she recognizes Jesus. He tells her that he is going to ascend to the Father and go and tell the disciples. So Mary goes, and that leads us to the 18th chapter. So we are reading the day of Easter, just the night. Okay, you're all with me? We're going to engage fear and doubt, and we are the night of Easter. Here we go. Starting at the 18th verse, it'll be up here, but also... Um, in your bulletin. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Judeans or the Jews. Let's stop right there. It is the night of Easter. Mary has come and told them that Jesus is alive. And what do the disciples do? They lock away in fear. Why? I mean, they shut the door, they lock the latch, and they, like, maybe close down the windows. Like, they're filled with fear. Why? 
I mean, maybe they're actually still lingering with grief. But you would think that they would have sent out like a search party to go looking for Jesus. What are they afraid of? This is a full participation. What do you think? What are they afraid of? Hmm? So they're afraid of getting arrested to be tortured and killed just like their rabbi Jesus. What else? Oh, so they've lost their protector. Jesus isn't with them. So now they're like their leader's gone. So what do they do? They're afraid. What else? Oh, judgment. Maybe they think Jesus is like this divine now poltergeist who's going to come and like haunt them and come not with love but with judgment and revenge because they're a room full of deniers and deserters. So maybe they're like, we don't want to know what he's going to say to us. Maybe. We don't know. But I want us to pause for a minute just with this fear. Like they are locked away for fear. It's very relatable, isn't it? Like, fear can paralyze us. Can you think about a time in your life when you have been so afraid that you're, like, frozen? Not knowing how to move forward? Fear, it taps into, like, the reptilian part of our brain. That, like, it's primal, and so we can freeze or flee. We can fawn. The fawn is the newest thing within psychologists talk about. That's for fo folks who fawn, they just want to please people. So maybe that potential threat will not harm them. But fight, flee, freeze, fawn. If anyway, we sometimes live into those things unconsciously. We don't even know that we're doing them. And fear is not all bad. I mean, think of the times that actually healthy fear is good. Like it keeps us from walking out in the middle of the street during rush hour or from petting a lion or for grabbing a pot of hot water with our bare hands. Like, fear can be good, right? But fear, fear can sometimes hold us in these cycles of inaction that keep us from healing and toward a future, toward moving forward in life. I find for many of us, fear can sometimes wake us up in the middle of the night. Does fear ever wake you up in the middle of the night? 2, 3, 4 a.m. and kind of creeps in between your dreams. It says you're not doing enough. You're alone. You do not matter. You're not safe. You'll never measure up. Fear has many, many different voices, but it taps into stuff that's very deep, deep in us. Fear keeps us from living a full life. We can become afraid of trying something new, changing jobs, getting ready for getting, needing therapy and going to a therapist, going to the doctor, asking for forgiveness, leaving a toxic relationship. For me, the fear of going to a professor and saying, I don't even know anything. I was filled with fear to go and talk to her. When I was in college, there was a woman who I lived with, who was a large house down at PLU, and for the entire year, my senior year, she lived in her room on the first floor with all of the boxes of her belongings, like stacked up high. She bought a couch and she slept on her couch, but she never unpacked. Like, so she would live in her boxes and she would spend hours, sometimes days in her room. I was young at 22. I didn't know she was needing mental health care, like she needed some professional help, but she was locked in deep, deep fear and sadness and grief to the point that it paralyzed her from even unboxing her belongings. Even when we have faith or that we trust in God, fear can lock us away, can isolate us. But Jesus appears in the fear. Let's read on. Jesus came and stood among them. I mean, I don't know how he kind of like came through this locked door, but it's kind of cool. So he came through this door and he said, peace be with you. After Jesus said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he said this, he breathed on them. And said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Jesus moves right past their fortified walls of fear and says, peace be with you. 
I mean, the image is beautiful, like he's standing right in front of them, right in the midst of all that they are feeling, their big, big feelings, and says, peace be with you. I imagine him turning to each one of them and having to say it really slow so it can kind of penetrate into their bones, peace be with you, peace be with you, peace be with you. This word peace can be translated quietness or rest, wholeness, or like peace of mind. Like this peace of Christ would actually would, would quiet the fear that would be residing inside of them. Jesus shows them his scars, the remnants of his death, and then again he says, peace be with you. And then, Jesus gives them the gift of the Holy Spirit. He breathes on them. Like, the resurrection extends not only from his body, but now extends to them. I mean, theologically, it's beautiful. And he breathes on them. He exhales the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he commissions the disciples to go and do the work of forgiveness in their everyday lives. He breathes on them, kind of like the dry bones that we heard a few weeks ago that finally take on flesh and bone and breath and purpose. So too, this little band of followers who were dead in a tomb, locked away in their own fear, they come alive with this gift of peace and this now purpose to go and to share this peace with others. This little church, this group of ten, come back to life. But reading on, but Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of nails in his hands, put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Can you blame Thomas? I mean, all the other disciples got to see Jesus and I don't know how they were, like, how would you feel? If they're the only one who didn't get to see Jesus. You feel left out. You feel like I, as someone who can be rather gullible, would be like, don't mess with me. Like, I only believe half of what my family says because they are always trying to get me. Maybe Thomas was afraid that they were going to get him in this, like, cruel and twisted kind of joke that Jesus was alive and they saw him. So he's like, no, I'm not going to believe you until I, until I see it. And he goes even further, not until I see Jesus, but I put my hands in his wounds and my hand in his side. Like, he wants some proof. And I don't blame him. I think we all sometimes want to have a little bit of evidence, something in our lives that will help us come to, to have a little bit of reassurance. And let's just call, let's... Thomas has often been called Doubting Thomas, and we can hear these simplistic ideas, don't doubt, but believe, don't be like Thomas. My goodness, let's give Thomas a break. Let's call him Honest Thomas. <laughs> right? He was honest. He wanted, he wanted something to make a little bit of sense because what the disciples were telling him, his friends, he's not believing it. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to them. So we continue on. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, do you notice they're shut? They're not locked. So something's happening. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. He says it again. Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered, my Lord and my God. Jesus met the disciples the week before in their fear and, and provided for them in the midst of their fear. Thomas, in the midst of his questions, in the midst of his doubt, Jesus provides. And, and not only says, hey, see me, but actually says, go ahead, touch my wounds. Put your hands here. It's um, It's gory. Like, I, I mean, it's, it, take a moment and think about this. He's like saying, touch, touch this, which is actually the most painful thing that I have experienced. Touch, go ahead. And then we continue on. Jesus said, or blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. 
Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which were not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Touch the wounds. Touch the wounds of Jesus. I've been trying to process this because I have every single Sunday after Easter, this is the scripture. Every single time. And you would think that by now I'm like not surprised by something. I was this year. Somehow I have missed that actually he would touch the wound. Like that visceral touching. I had always in my mind thought just seeing. Touch changes the whole scene for me. And it made me pause and think, what does it mean that Jesus actually invites Thomas to touch his wounds and then also will now send them all, uh, these disciples, out again? It makes me wonder, when do we touch the wounds of Christ today? Have you ever thought about that? When do we touch the wounds of Christ today? I'm looking out at many of you who have jobs where you are working with teens who are going through very difficult situations. Every day you are touching the wounds of Christ. I'm looking out at a few people who are giving care, long time care to loved ones, and it's not easy. And you are touching the wounds of Christ. Christ, like, comes and actually experiences the fullness of our suffering. And when we go about our life, we are drawn in to touch the wounds of Christ in the world today. This journey of faith, Christianity, as followers of way, there are two foundational things that can kind of ground our fear and our doubt that can kind of like help us in the midst of all the things we still can't understand. There's two, two gifts that we have. We have the incarnation. The incarnation that Christ, Jesus, like wears human flesh, like God divine wears human flesh, comes and lives and breathes and knows our limitations, knows our anxieties, knows our fears, knows our doubts, knows our pain, knows our suffering in his own body. So we have the incarnation, which is gorgeous. And then we have the resurrection. This trust that God is stronger than death and violence and evil. And that none of these can match the creative and liberating work of God. They can't touch locked doors that are filled with fear. They can't touch hearts that are grieving in despair. They can't touch the gift of the resurrection, which is always yielding life. Peter Enns wrote this phenomenal book called The Sin of Certainty. I highly recommend it. I think that we've got to take like a journey through this whole book. Um, it's called this, The Sin of Certainty, Why God Desires Our Trust More Than Our Correct Beliefs. He also has a wonderful podca podcast called the Bible for normal people. I highly recommend it. Just when you're out for a walk, listen to Peter Enns. He does a great job. But he writes this. Struggling with faith is normal. Journey and pilgrimage have become powerful words for me for describing the life of faith. I have come to expect periods of unsettledness, uncertainty, and fear to remind me that who I am and where I am and what I think do not define reality. Facing and then truly being present with my experiences along the way help me to remember that my experiences at any moment are not the entire journey, including those periods where God is distant. I have come to believe that periods of struggling and doubt and fear are common experiences in faith, including in the Bible that something is meant to be learned from such periods, however long in duration they might be. Today, if you find yourself going, well, what does this mean, Casey, for tomorrow? Like, I have to get up and I have to go to work. 
What does Jesus showing up to the disciples mean for me tomorrow? What does it mean for me this week as I have to go about my to-do list? Why does this matter? It's a good question. Perhaps at this moment you're like, dang it, why did you ask this question? Because now I'm like freaked out a little bit. My hope is that you ask a lot of questions, that you wonder, that you don't run from your doubt. And even as you enter in your day tomorrow, perhaps you pause and remember how Jesus met the disciples. What did he say? Peace be with you. Like, peace be with you in the midst of your fear. Peace be with you in the midst of the things you can't figure out yet. Peace be with you in a really stressful day tomorrow. Peace be with you. And now, share that peace with others. He commissions them to go and share forgiveness. Now go share that peace. Like, what does this mean? Jesus is wanting to bring you back to life, to breathe new life in you, and to send you out to be peace, to be love. You've got a job to do. And sometimes the doubters and the deserters and the fearful are the best messengers. So know you're in good company. Wherever you find yourself on your spiritual map, Jesus is showing up, will continue to show up and say to you, peace be with you. Do you know, I'm sorry, I'm talking on and on and on, but we say peace be with you every single Sunday. And it is not a time to just get up and say hi to your friends. We're actually supposed to turn to each other, look each other in the eyes and say peace be with you because we forget. So this is a liturgical practice of turning toward each other, and it's an act of actually practicing forgiveness, practicing love, practicing care, so we can do it out in the world. So later on, after we have the prayers and we do the peace be with you, and you get up and move and you share peace be with you, that's practice. It's like we are practicing, working our muscles of faith so we can do this out in the world as we go and we serve God. Mm. I mean, that's good, isn't it? Like it's baked into who we are. So may God bless you in your doubt, in your fear, and may the peace of Christ hold on to you as God breathes new life in you. Let us pray. Holy, most gracious God, dang, you do so much and we can miss it. Breathe your spirit into any places in our life where there is fear, where there is doubt, and we know, holy God, that those are things we do not have to worry about, but you come and you dwell with us, and as we engage our fear and our doubt, our wondering, our questions, you are present. Be with us in all the different spaces where you call us, even in our doubt and questions, to be your love and your peace. We pray all this in your most holy and blessed name. Amen. Amen. Amen.